Good day, everyone. What a, um, what a fantastic uh, presentation Dave's was. It's ironic, actually, Dave mentioned a uh, forming buck and uh, for Ferraris and the like early in his piece and about being a, uh, a compilation of, uh, of uh, hand pieces, uh, handmade pieces. One of the case studies that I'll cov cover at the end is exactly, uh, exactly what Dave was talking about. So as it, um, I've been uh, playing in the 3D scanning and printing space for the last 20 years. Uh, we're based up at uh, Peakhurst in New South Wales, not too far from here. And uh, hopefully we can run through today a few, uh, a few examples of what's possible. So if anyone wants any questions along the way, uh, just yell out. This is what people think we do. Take a picture, turn it into a model. Uh, in, in principle, we're a 3D photocopying service. That's a 2D photocopier. Uh, this was made a little, quite a few years ago. So we'll run through what is scanning, what is printing, who does it, some of the tools, and then we'll get into the, uh, the fun stuff of some case studies, because that's, uh, that's where you'll really understand what's possible. Uh, just to, to start off, a 3D scanner takes the real world, puts it back into the computer in 3D for us to do, do stuff with, makes things faster, makes it more accurate, and it's all about doing the job for the, re for the purpose of which you want to achieve. Those two images there, it's all about resolution, just like taking a photo. The one on the right is a high-res scan of a brick wall. The one on the left is low-res. You can see the difference, I hope. Outside of the, uh, the vintage motorbike car space, which we're talking about today, we, we play with uh, mechanical engineering and architectural movies, um, virtual reality, museum spaces. Olympic, the Olympic uh, yacht team down the bottom there, they, uh, they won gold at the 2012 Olympics. We selected which boat was going to be the fastest for them through analysis of 3D data. This is our toolkit. Um, I've got one of the scanners here today, just one of the small ones that was easy, so if you want to come over and see how it works, we can do that over here in the back, at the back. But today, um, I was just going to run through uh, the end results. So just to give you a real quick feet understanding of what happens, this is just a little, uh, a little statue that we scanned. Top left, the black dots, that's just the 3D scan data. It's called a point cloud. It's next to useless to anyone but me. The blue one down the bottom, that's your STL file. It's a conversion from the scan data. That you can go directly to 3D printers with. But if we wanted to end up doing a replication of a casting, we would have to then do either of the two gold models, a surface or a solid model. We do that over the top of the scan data so that we accurately repl replicate the shape of, of uh, your casting or your tank or whatever. So just a quick rundown, just the basics of what 3D printing is. It's, a th it's creating a 3D form by, by laying down material one layer at a time. It might be 0.1, might be 0 0.03 of a millimetre. But the, the way in which it does that is defined by CAD. Most people are probably familiar with machining. That's the removal of material a layer at a time defined by CAD. So really it's only the reverse of, of, uh, of uh, CNC machining. Some of, the thing, some of the processes that we're all familiar with that are used in 3D printing are uh, inkjet printing. We, we squirt down glue. We, uh, we, we melt plastic and, and, and lay it down. The whole metal printing space is basically 3D con controlled TIG welding. And, the co and then there's also some curing. So if you think in those, those concepts of this is familiar, but just done a different way. Um, people say it's, it's only relatively new. 3D printing was designed in 1989. So it's been around for a little while. And then there's a succession of different, um, different technologies that evolved over those years. But we won't bore you too much with that stuff. This is sort of uh, uh, just to give you a bit of an appreciation. You can go into Audi and spend 300 bucks and get the, mach the little 3D printer up in the top left corner or you end up at the bottom right at about two million doing a direct metal printer. 
And uh, each one of those machines on that, on that page generally only makes one or two materials. So if you want to, if you want to be able to work in 10 different materials, you usually got to buy five different printers. So it's, um, it, you're better off going to someone and sharing what, uh, what technologies we have around between us. So that's just a bit of a quick rundown on, on the technology. Um, like I said, if you want to come and chat about that side of things, feel free, I'm here all of today and all of tomorrow. But the fun stuff, let's talk about what, what we have done and what can be done, because that's what everyone's here for. So <coughs> one, of our, one of our pride and joy jobs was a uh, 1914 French Delage Grand Prix race car. Three of these cars were built in 1913 for the 1914 race, race uh, season. Uh, then World War I broke out and, and all racing ended. This particular car is the only one that survives in the world. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, that engine block, which has an integrated engine head, um, formed a, formed a uh, hole between the water jacket and it no longer ran. A fairly uh, disappointed owner. So we were approached and said, could we possibly make him a new engine block? Of course, the answer was, yeah, of course we can do that. Then he said, I want, I want my new engine block to have every mark, dint, uh, discrepancy that all the mechanics that have hit it with a hammer and slipped with a screwdriver and spanner over the years has. So we said, yes, we can do that too. So the basic, the basic process is what you see here, starting there with, with uh, the 3D scanning of the existing block. That particular arm works to around 30 microns or, or just over a thou in the old school. Not only did we scan the block, we probed every machined surface and every machined hull. Ironically, that's a four and a half litre four cylinder engine. It runs double overhead camshafts, four valves per cylinder, pentagonal shaped combustion chambers, and was designed in 1913. It's pretty cool stuff. We, we looked at it and said actually there was 44 cores or patterns used back then to make this block. The technology that they didn't have back then to make this was amazing. So our process then became the bottom, the bottom left photo. That's the, uh, the 3D model of the block with machining allowance added and also contraction at, uh, applied. So it's going to be uh, poured out of, uh, mold, out of uh, cast steel, 2.9 something odd percent shrinkage, the, uh, the foundry told us. We factored that into the CAD model before, of course, we designed the, the moulds. The difference here is we did not use patterns. The mould was, was designed from the CAD model of the, of the engine block, and the two photos in the middle are 3D printed sand moulds, foundry sand off a 3D printer down in Melbourne. Top, top left, oh, sorry, top right, those moulds in in the, um, at the foundry ready to pour. And I won't bore you with the uh, process of pouring metal into a, into a hole on this one, but you'll see there, there's the before and after of the two blocks. That block was, that's actually prior to um, finished machining. So the one on the, 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 the greyer one is obviously our rough cast. That was machined, backboard for, for valve, for um, valve seats, uh, finished machined, and hopefully, ah, thank you. This is the end result. A runner. So yeah, that car, um, I suppose you would call it worthless because Jay Leno keeps sending this, uh, the owner of this car a blank check and he keep, keeps sending it back to him. So it's, uh, it's nice to, Nice to know that we saved a um, saved a, such an iconic vehicle, and the owner's 82 years of age and still drives it around down in Melbourne just for uh, just for fun. So earlier on, Dave mentioned um, the process of creating form bucks and sheet metal being being um, formed in multiple pieces to build a car. This is exactly the project I wanted that uh, Dave was referring to. Actually, uh, customer E-Type Jag. He wanted to do a replica aluminium body of um, <coughs> that particular model car, the one that's in the, in the foreground, the small one. 
It's, uh, it was a one and only race uh, shape that they, they ran in 1964, crashed out, the car doesn't exist anymore. So we scanned the both cars, and in this case, the end result is handmade sheet metal aluminium parts, just like what Dave has just shown us. And just like what Dave started with there in his, in his presentation, he had a form buck uh, that he'd made out of cardboard. This is one made for that car, that full-size car, out of MDF, which has been CNC routed at a, at a kitchen routing place. And then just finger jointed over the top of each other. The coloured blocks were where there was a change, a tradition in, a, a transition in shape, you know, bottom corner of windscreens, those sorts of things. And we 3D printed those blocks and put them in between the MDF, the MDF form, uh, form tool. So um, this is purely, no, very, very little 3D printing, but it's all mostly about the 3D scanning side of things. And what Dave was referring to, there's the form buck and each individual aluminium panel that's been rolled, beaten, hand finished and ready for uh, marking out and welding together. So the entire car was built this way. Um, this is where, you know, if you look about the motorcycle, you know, the motorbikes around the place here and what, what you just saw with Dave, scanning an existing tank, creating a form tool, either cutting that out of, uh, uh, getting that laser cut out of three mil aluminium and giving it to Dave, he could, be, he could beat out a, uh, a tank to suit that form tool that we could provide, either 3D printed or, or routed out. Fairings, um, guards, whatever. But anyway, again, this is all about just, uh, you know, what's possible. <coughs> um, this was a fairly, a little bit more uh, specific to this, to this uh, audience. Um, particular gentleman had changed his tank, it's a cust complete custom shaped tank, but he wanted the Triumph badge to be s similar in styling to the originals, so that when you walk past it looked, yeah, it looked original, but obviously it, it fitted the new form tank. <coughs> so to do that, we scanned the tank, we scanned the original badge, we redesigned a badge that was in the same styling, same, um, yeah, Triumph, um, text. Then uh, they were they were 3D printed in plastic. Could have easily been printed in wax and sent off for lost wax casting, but for this particular application, because it was going to be chrome plated rather than polished, um, we just, we printed in plastic, sent it off for for chrome plating over the plastic up at um, the bronzing studio up in uh, Castle Hill. And then it came back and was, and the black and the, and the beige was uh, hand painted back in by um, our model makers. And then those, they were just uh, sick of flicked onto the tank rather than, rather than screwed on like they originally. I've got those, uh, those um, we did two sets. So I've got a set of them up here at the back if anyone wants to look at those. Motorcycle engine block. This was for a university student, but um, it, it's a fairly modern four-cylinder. I think it's a, a 1200 or something or other. Um, 3D scanned, that's the scan data. At the same time, if you may be able to make out around the holes, there's little blue lines, that's the probed centers of all the holes. So that's at a much higher accuracy. So, excuse me, that's your machining, your uh, machining information. So. From that, we then create a 3D solid model, and it's that solid model that you could either um, increase in size, scale up the two or three percent if you want to do a casting, or send it to a CNC machine and, and machine it at a billet. This particular project, the young the young guy was using in that model to simulate heat transfer around the water cooling passages to see if he can improve. Um, the design to um, to get more horsepower out of the out of the same volume, etc. And we actually had an old motorbike that we had to uh, scan, but this one was this one was for a. Uh, uh, we do a lot of work in the movie industry, so it was just for a vi visual effects um, in Peter Rabbit one. <coughs> but what I want to talk to you here about is people say, "Here, can you scan the entire bike?" You'll see there on the one on the right, 
there's a lot of data missing. That's because the scanner can't see past the other parts of the bike. So if, the, if your project is to work on your crankcase, your cylinder, um, carby bowls, whatever, generally to be able to do it in a complete, we have to, you, you have to come to us with the, with, the, um, with the bike pulled apart. So um, this, was, this particular one here was uh, 1956 Maserati. Uh, there's three cars apparently in Australia. One that's running and two that didn't have um, viable engine sumps and lids. The, uh, they, they say that the, the Italians are really smart at designing stuff. That lid is actually the bottom of the sump. So the oil is constantly in contact with the, uh, with the gasket and these things leak like sieves. But anyway, um, <laughs> but a great design all the same. <laughs> um, so the, uh, just like the engine block, can we, can we uh, produce two, two new sumps and lids for the other two cars that don't run? The funny thing was the owner was adamant that no one in the world could do this apart from the Italians who made the car in the first place. But he didn't want to send the sump over to them because it's the only one that exists over here. So we scanned it sent the data to Italy, 18 months later they rang the owner and said, we don't know how to do it. We can't, we can't pull it off. So he came back to us. And um, so we just f followed the same process that we always have, remodeled the scan data, uh, both the lid and the sump, um, added the red is uh, machining allowance, added to the, to the sump face. Obviously, we're going to cast it and we're going to have to machine that back off so we get ni a nice sealing surface. And you'll see that's also at the starter motor and, um, and the, um, I think that's the forward engine mount as well. But, uh, but this is the feedback we get whilst we're doing the work. So we know how accurately we're modelling to the scan data. Because there's no point doing it if we're not working it to, the, to, the, you know, to an assumable accuracy. These are the, the 3D moulds, again, they're going off for, three, for sand printing, and this is going to be a uh, aluminium sand cast. Those moulds, you can see the multiple pieces for the, um, uh, for the sump itself. And you'll also see in the bottom, the bottom right corner, that's the core to make the, the, the volume where the, um, <coughs> the oil's going to sit. So you print the, the moulds and the cores all on the, 3D, the sand 3D printer. Um, this so this one's actually a video of uh, the one on the right. Yep. So the one on the right is actually pour, pouring of metal into a 3D printed sand mold. Um, it's really exciting stuff. What is key is that we actually have to work with foundries that understand one-off work rather than guys that, that deal in tens of thousands. And that took a little bit. So we've actually got one foundry that we work with with, with non-ferrous and another foundry that we work with for, um, for ferrous metals. So anyway, so that's the, uh, yeah, the pour done and the resulting rough casting on the, uh, on the left. And again, here's the, the original with the rough, the rough casting beside it. Um, we were working for the engine rebuilder who was going to do all the machining himself on this one. So we just left that. But before it goes to him, it has to also, because it's aluminium, had to go for heat treatment because the, um, so to get rid of the residual stresses. So this is just a little funny with 3D printing. You know, what my parents think we do, we're just burning money. You know, what everybody else thinks we, we're doing, um, you know, printing 3D guns. You know, what I think I do, the wonderful spanner, and what usually happens, you end up with a mess of filament.